Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to the Analyst by Vajiram and Ravi, where we would try to comprehensively analyze nine articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express, especially from the perspective of the upcoming UPSC Civil Services mains exam. In the first article, we'll talk about the crisis in Myanmar and the rise of several ethnic armed organizations. In the second article, we'll talk about the need to address the geriatric care in India. In the third article, we'll talk about the importance of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics domain. In the fourth article, we'll talk about the debates surrounding the anti-conversion laws in India. In the fifth article, we'll have a discussion with respect to the urgent need of reforms in the Law Commission of India. Finally, in the preliminary separate sections, we'll have a look at some of the very important topics for the preliminary exam. Now, coming to the very first article, it is about the Myanmar's catastrophe. Now, we all know that Myanmar has been trapped into a conflict-like situation in the last few years. And that has actually ravaged the nation in terms of the violence, in terms of the ethnic conflicts. And that has also resulted into the rise of the ethnic armed organizations, various ethnic armed organizations. Now, this issue therefore needs to be studied in great detail. Now, this is a part of GS2, India and its neighborhood relations and GS3, security challenges in the border areas. Now, before we analyze this topic, let's first see what is the importance of Myanmar for India, right? So the first is, the very first is the strategic location. So as you can just see in the map, that Myanmar shares a land border of around 1,643 kilometers with India. So we have the bordering states of Arunachal, we have Nagaland, we have Manipur, and we have Mizoram, which share a land boundary with M Myanmar. Now, therefore, this country, that is Myanmar, becomes very important, especially when we look at it from a security perspective. Next is the tribal and cultural ties. What you need to keep in mind is that, that there are many tribal groups which are spread on both the sides of the border and which share cultural links. For example, let's talk about the Nagas. So Nagas not only inhabit in India, but also they inhabit in Myanmar, right? Then you have got a particular community known as Zozomi the Zozomi community. Now, this community in Myanmar, it has links with the community of cookies in Manipur, right? So, they share tribal linkages, cultural relations. Next is the internal security. Now, we all know that for years, the northeastern part of the country of India, that has been, it, it has been suffering from a lot of insurgent activities. Obviously, it has reduced to a very low level as of now. But that insurgency, it was primarily a result of the threats which were, which were also posed from the other side of the border. So, we had some of the organizations like NSCN, right? They received su support from the other side of the border, right? Next is countering China. See, China for years has been supporting the military junta through funds, through military supplies. And as of now, according to this very article, what it says is that China is also supporting different ethnic armed organizations, right? Therefore, it actually weakens the strategic space for India in Myanmar, right? Next is economic cooperation, especially after 2014. India initiated a lot of neighborhood policy reforms, right? So we also had this Act East policy and we also had this neighborhood first, right? So India has been focusing upon the economic interactions, especially with the neighboring countries. For example, we have the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Project. But because of these instability, because of the instability in Myanmar, that is leading to a sort of slowed progress in terms of these projects, right? So that is what we see that Myanmar is a very crucial sort of partner or you can say a very important country when it comes to the strategic interests of India. Now, before we examine, before we analyze this uh, topic in great detail, it is necessary to see that what have been the political transactions, uh, transitions over the years, right? So if we go chronologically, what we see is that in the pre-colonial times, we had the Myanmar, and at that time it was known as Burma. It was primarily ruled by hereditary monarchs. So notably, we had the Pagan Empire. Pagan Empire, right? Then we had the British conquest in the year 1885. Then British exploited Myanmar in the maximum possible extent, and it suppressed the British, the Burmese nationalism, right? Then there was a personality in Burma known as by the name of Aung San. Aung San. Now, this person, he actually contributed a lot when it comes to the independence of Burma. Later, it became Myanmar. And it was through his effort that Myanmar transitioned to a parliamentary democracy. However, after a few months, this person was assassinated. And he's also still known as the national sort of hero of Myanmar, right? Post-independent, as I told, that it was the 
contributions of uh, Aung San, which resulted into the independence of this country and a transition to a parliamentary democracy. But after his assassination, what happened is that the country went into the political instability, right? So what happened is that we had the rule of General Navin, Navin, right? And he actually led a one-party socialist state one partly so party socialist state which focused upon the military spending and which did not focus upon the economic progress of the country as a whole right so obviously it led to economic hardships right so that resulted into a lot of protests by the people of Myanmar right so we had one particular protest uh, whose name was the 8888 uprising now this was primarily as a result of the economic hardships and the desire for democracy however the army brutally suppressed this particular protest Next, we had the rise of Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, she is the daughter of the Aung San, as I started in the beginning. So, she is a daughter of Aung San. And at, it was in the years of 1980s that Aung San Suu Kyi became the face of the political transitions. That is the face of democracy in Myanmar, right? And then she was also house arrested. Then what we saw, saw was that, that under the pressure, the military initiated some of the political reforms. For example, it released some of the political prisoners and allowed for some political participations. So therefore, what we had is we had election in the year 2010 and in the year 2015. And the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, that is National League for Democracy, NLD, it emerged victorious. But the point of concern is that we have the 2008 constitution by the military and it gives very less power to the civilian government and most of the important powers are with the military itself right so therefore there was no use of the of, of winning of the Aung San Suu Kyi's parties right so what we saw was that that uh, we had this uh, limited government and in the year 2020 we had the military coup and in the military coup different political sort of activ activists were taken were detained and also including the Aung San Suu Kyi and it was the military had a total control over all over the country and this resulted into the forming of the national unity government now what is this national unity government see national unity government comprises of all these persons which are sort of ousted which were ousted because of the military coup right and that is what we can say is it's a government in exile right so what we have seen is that since this military coup the country has been ravaged it has it is totally suffering from the violence and ethnic conflicts now what is happening is that along with these ethnic conflicts we are also witnessing the rise of some of the very important resistance forces along with the ethnic armed organizations now in order to explain this let's look at the map of Myanmar so what you can see is that in this map we have some of the states in Myanmar right now there is a particular alliance whose name is the brotherhood brotherhood alliance and it comprises of three entities the first is the Arakan army the second is the Myanmar national democratic alliance army and the third is the Tang national liberation army right so these three entities make up the brotherhood alliance so what this article says is that this particular alliance which is fighting the military in Myanmar it has captured a lot of places from the military in the Shan state right it also gives us the information that a particular that is Kachin independence army that has actually captured a lot of military posts from the military and it has also captured a lot of trade routes which are going towards China right then we have the Arakan army we have the Arakan army now this is primarily in the Rakhine state as you can see it is in the Rakhine state now what you need to keep in mind is that that this Arakan army it basically gets the support from the fundamentalists or the radical forces the radical Buddhist forces right and it is one of the organizations which has been implicated for the atrocities committed on the Rohingyas right so do remember this so what we see is that because of these because of these ethnic armed organizations what we are seeing is that there is a sort of reduce or the weakening in the military's power next is there have been the fears of balkanization 
now what do we mean by balkanization i just want to see who all of you know what balkanization is do write the definition of balkanization or just tell me what this process of balkanization is all about so primarily it it actually means the fragmentation of the country right so there are fears that myanmar might sort of divide or might break into various fragments also we have the prime minister of bangladesh who has actually alleged that there might be there is a possible idea of carving out some parts from bangladesh and some parts from myanmar and declaring a sovereign state right so there are concerns regarding balkanization also now all these things obviously point out towards a very negative picture right so that is the reason we have to uh, go towards a possible solution where myanmar restores its sort of democracy right now what is the impact of this on the region and on india in particular so if we analyze the impact of this crisis on the region what we can see is the impact of this particular crisis on asean right we all know that asean is a a very important regional organization now the first is the loss of unity see the regional organization that is asean it actually has a very core principle and that core principle is about non interference in the internal matters of different countries but what we are witnessing is that because of this crisis what is happening is that there are some countries in asean for example indonesia or uh, singapore who have openly denounced the sort of capture the military coup in the myanmar whereas we have got some countries like laos or cambodia which are actually indirectly supporting the military junta in myanmar right so there is a sort of loss of unity when it comes to asean right next is security concerns what you need to keep in mind is that because of these ethnic conflicts because of these fights among different organizations what we are witnessing is that there is a rise of the spilling of this crisis in the other country in the other adjoining countries right so there is a possible case of proliferation of arms or increased armed activities next is economic disruption see please understand asean as an organization it one of the very important pillars of asean is the trade and investment but because of this crisis in myanmar the trade and investment aspect of the asean is suffering next is humanitarian crisis obviously just look at the rohingya crisis right and obviously there are different sort of uh, ethnic organizations which are at war with each other right so it is obviously leading to people going beyond the borders and that is leading to a concern with respect to the other countries it is also a concern for india it is also a concern for the other countries right so these are the general concerns when we talk about the region in particular now what are the impacts on india the first and the foremost is security concerns see please understand as i told in this map that the border which india shares with myanmar it is very porous and we have got a lot of tribals living on either side of the border which share the cultural linkages the tribal linkages right so what we are witnessing is that because of this crisis in myanmar a lot of sort of refugee influx has been there at the border and that is leading to a a possible border tension right it is also leading to the sort of increase in the insurgent activities you are very very well aware of the manipur crisis manipur crisis now if i ask you what is one of the reasons because or which which has actually aggravated this manipur crisis is that we have a particular community as i told in the beginning the zo zomi community right and that has been infiltrating into the indian side that is in the, on the manipur side because it has cultural linkages with the kukis and kukis are at war with the maithis war is not the right word but they have got differences with respect to the other community that is the maithis right and that is obviously leading to the greater conflict next is the trade investment and connect, uh, connectivity disruptions see please understand that for we have we have been focusing upon the economic partnerships for example we have got the kaladan multimodal transit project right now this project tries to connect the kolkata with the mizoram via the myanmar so if you just look at the map it is trying to connect we have kolkata somewhere here this is a port right so it is trying to connect the kolkata with the mizoram through myanmar right through the water route through the river route and it is actually trying to develop the sitwe port now the problem is that because of this crisis as i told you that the arakan army is possibly looking to actually control these ports now there is a particular port by the name of kyakfew port right 
Now, this is a port where we have the Chinese sort of a lot of investments done by the Chinese and the Sitwe port, which is primarily uh, sort of uh, being developed by India, right? So, the concern is that from the Kyokfe port, we have got the sort of pipelines which are carrying out the oil and gas towards the Yunnan province of China. So, from here, we have got the pipelines which are going towards the Yunnan province. Now, there is a concern that if the Arakan army controls over these ports, if it gains controls over these ports, it would lead to sort of disruption to the transfer of oil and gas, right? So, that is a possible concern for China. But if we talk about India, the same concern lies that if the Arakan army controls this part, that is the Sitwe port, obviously, it would not be good for the Kaladan multimodal transit project. Next is strategic competition with China. Now, as I said in the beginning, the China for years has been funding a lot of infra projects in Myanmar. It has been supplying with military supplies. It has been giving a lot of military supplies to the military janta. And now what the article says is that it has also been supplying the military arms, arms and ammunitions to the ethnic armed organizations. Right. So that is a possible concern for India. Next is humanitarian considerations. See. There have been there have been allegations that India has not rightly sort of criticized the atrocities committed by the military junta on the minorities in Myanmar, right? And also, as I said, that initially we had the free movement regime. We had the free movement regime where the people, where the tribal groups, free movement regime under the Ministry of Home Affairs, right, where the tribal people could go without the visa for a certain time period. But that has been revoked. It has been cancelled. And that has not been taken into good light by the tribes which are living on both the sides of the border, right? So th these are some of the impact on India in particular. Now, what should be the way forward for this crisis? So see, obviously, it's not a one pill solution. We need to have a multi pronged approach. So what it means is that first there needs to be internal solutions. What do you mean by internal solutions? There has to be now we already saw that there is the emergence of various entities. For example, we have got the military junta. Then we have got the national unity government. Right, then we have the ethnic armed organizations. Right, then we have got civil society organizations and other entities. What we need is that these people should come on board. They need to have a particular dialogue and then they should reach to a particular solution. Now, what the as what the article point out is that that they can also learn from the the agreement which India has done, the, the kind of policies which India has sort of taken forward. For example, we all know that the northeastern region of India, it is separated from the mainland. But still India managed, India has managed to sort of do a lot of things, a lot of to carry out a lot of projects in the northeast to make sure that there are various agreements, various peace accords have been signed, right? And that has to a great extent brought peace to the region. But what we are witnessing now is the condition in the Myanmar is not the same. The in the Myanmar demands that there has to be a proper dialogue between different entities, right? So learning can be from India. Next, there has to be a power sharing agreement. See, we need to understand that the 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 kind of suppress suppression which the Myanmar Janta is having on the people that is not sustainable. There would be a time where the military Janta has to yield, right? So there is a need for a proper transition, the proper transition to a full fledged democracy, and for that there has to be a power sharing agreement that is between the military and between the other entities, right? Next is the constitutional reform. As I said in the beginning, that the 2008 constitution. It gives huge powers to the military. Now, this has to be amended. It has to be amended so as to make sure that the democratic parties get the adequate powers and authority, right? What can be the external solutions? The first is ASEAN's role. Now, we all know that there is the principle of non-interference in each other's matter. But see, ASEAN will have to come out of this sort of uh, this, this clause. And what can be done is that the ASEAN countries, they should have a unified approach so that they can put pressure on Myanmar and make sure that the democratic transition take place. Next is international pressure. See, we have countries like the US or the Western countries who have been putting constant, consistent sanctions on some of the leaders of the military junta. Now, that has to be continued with, right? Next is humanitarian aid. Now, what we know is that the humanitarian conditions, the humanitarian aspect in Myanmar is not good. And 
what we all know is uh, you know the conditions of rohingyas right so what we need to have is a proper arrangement where adequate supplies where adequate sort of resources are given to these people who are displaced and then provisions are made for their safe return right so see definitely this is a crisis which is spilling beyond the borders beyond the borders of Myanmar and it has great ramifications whether it's for India or for the other countries of the ASEAN. So we need a multifaceted approach and we need to make sure that the government in the Myanmar that is right now the military janta it actually gives adequate powers to the other sort of uh, entities as well so that it's not the case there should not be a case of the balkanization of Myanmar or there should not be a case where you know different communities are fighting against each other that should not happen and there should be a smooth transition to a democratic polity in Man in Myanmar also, right? So that is for this topic. Now, before we go to the next topic, we have some questions. The one is for Pri and the other is for the Wains. The problems question says, community sometimes mentioned in the news. So we have the Kurd, we have got the Madesi, we have got the Rohingya. Now, there are countries, Bangladesh, Nepal and Myanmar. Which of the pairs given above are correctly matched? One and two, two only, two and three, three only, right? So let me see who answers first in the comment section. Now, there is also a very important means question. This is from the year 2014. The question says, how does the illegal transborder migration pose a threat to India's security? Discuss the strategies to curb this, bringing out the various factors which give impetus to such migration. So, do write an answer on this and if possible, do post it in the comment section. Now, the next topic is with respect to the geriatric care. That is the care with respect to the elderly population. Now, we all know that the population in India, it is aging. It is going towards that transition. So therefore, there's a need to focus more upon providing adequate geriatric care, right? And therefore, what we can see is that adequate focus has to be given on the pensions, health services and social care needs of this segment of the population. Now, this is with respect to the GS2 social sector, welfare schemes for the vulnerable sections. Now, as I told in the beginning, that India as of now, it is witnessing an exponential growth in the number and proportion of the elderly people, right? Now, primarily, there are two reasons for it. The first reason is that there has been the reduction in the total fertility rate. The fertility rate has been reducing. The second is that there has been an increasing life expectancy. There has been increasing life expectancy. The life expectancy has been increasing. So combining these two factors, what we see is that the aged population in India, its proportion and its segment in the overall population, it has been increasing. Now, also, according to the United Nations Population Fund Agency, what it uh, says is that as of now, we have the elderly in India which comprise the 10% of the present population. Now, this is expected to go to 19.5% by the year 2050. Also, according to the other data sources, what we can see is that in the year 2050, there would be approximately 300 million elderly people in India. And as of now, the number is around 104 million, according to the census of 2011, right? Now, if we compare the elderly population in India with that of the population of different countries around the world, so what we can see is that the elderly population in India, that is of 134 million in 2020. Now, this is fast reaching the current size of population of Mexico and that of Russia. Also, it says that the 2050 population of elderly will be close to the population of the United States as of today. India's 12 million population of 80 plus people, that this is actually equal to the total population of countries like Belgium, Greece or Cuba, right? So adequate attention has to be required. Now, if you, if you just look at this graph, you can see that it shows it, the trends with respect to the decadal growth in the elderly population compared to the general population. Now, if you look at this graph, just see that the decadal growth rate of the elderly population, it was 25.2 in the in the decade of 1991 till 2001, right? And at that point of time, the decadal population growth rate of the entire population, it was 21.5%. So the gap is not much. But if you look at the projected, that is from 2021 till 2031, what you see is that the expected sort of uh, decadal growth rate of the elderly population would be 40.5 percent right and that would be around 8.5 for the overall population so there has been the increase in the gap right so this shows that we need to focus on the adequate sort of provisions with respect to the geriatric care the old persons now what are the challenges with respect to the elderly population in india so if we analyze the social challenges the first is the social neglect 
So what we have been seeing is that these elderly people in India, they face a sort of social neglect. Now, this is primarily because of the Western education or the globalization or because of the nuclear families, right? And this, the social neglect faced by them is it's, it's from the youngsters in the country. Next is the abuse of the elderly population. There have been instances and many instances where these elderly uh, segment of the society, they have been suffering from the exploitation, whether it's the physical, whether it's the emotional, psychological or financial, right? Next is the feminization of aging. See, because of the social bias against the women in the country, what we, ha what we have witnessed is that there has been an unequal distribution of resources when it comes to the women. And once these women reach to an old age, there is sort of an exploitation, sometimes even to the extent of physical exploitation, sexual, sexual exploitation, or we have the financial or other forms of exploitation, right? Next is the economic and financial challenges. Now, what we need to keep in mind is that this segment of the society, that is the elderly segment, it has lack of income and poor financial status. And this is primarily because of the fact that they don't have the access, the adequate access to the pension services. And if even if they're getting the pensions, the amount is very meek, it's very small. Next is the low funding by the government. What we need to keep in mind is that the government of India spends only 1% of its GDP when it comes to the pensions. Now, this obviously is a very small amount and it is not something which can maintain that momentum of providing the adequate pensions to this segment. Next is lack of housing and other basic amenities. What we have been witnessing is that this segment of the population, it is not entitled or it does not have adequate access to the affordable houses. Or even if you have provided the affordable houses, they are inappropriate or they're not in accordance to their needs, right? Then there are issues with respect to the health and other challenges. So what we see is that there has been a rise in the age related chronic illnesses. So there has been a rise in the non-communicable diseases. There has been the rise in the cataract issues cataract issues, there has been the rise in terms of the mental illnesses or the hearing problems, right? Next is there's increasing need for geriatric care. So what we can summarize is that because of the lack of adequate resources, be it with the government or be it with the individual households, there is an increasing dependency with respect to this old age segment and it calls for a greater diversion of resources. Now, what have been the government initiatives when it comes to the elderly care in India? The first and the foremost is the National Policy for Older Persons 2011. Now, this primarily focuses on three aspects. The first is it actually makes sure that the young population makes provisions for their old age related sort of expenses, right? Second, it actually tries to make sure that the non-governmental organizations in the country, they also work towards the age, old age related sort of works. Next, the third point is that they try to make sure that adequate policies are implemented for this particular segment. Now, next is the Indira Gandhi National Old Age Pension Scheme. Now, this aims to provide the pensions to the uh, people above the 60 years of age from the below poverty line segment of the society. Next is the Vyoshri Rashtriya Vyashri Yojana. Now, this aims to provide the physical aids or the assisted living devices to this segment to the old age people, right? Next is the Pradhan Mantri Vaya Bandana Yojana. Now, this aims to provide the social security benefits and also make sure that this is protected old age people are protected from the uncertain future conditions, market conditions. Next is the Senior Care Aging and Growth Engine Initiative and SAGE Portal. See, please understand, we have got a many startups in the country which are focusing upon the goods and services which are meant for this old age segment. So the government of India is trying to give them subsidies or other incentives so as to promote their participation. Now, what should be the way forward? The first and foremost is the formalization of care giving economy. See, what has been, what our Niti Aayog data shows us that the home-based care, that the home-based care can reduce the unnecessary hospital visits by almost 65% and it can also reduce the hospital expenses by 20%. So if you have the home-based care, now this is a data from the Niti Aayog, it says that it can reduce the unnecessary hospital visits by 65% and the hospital cost by 20%. Therefore, adequate focus has to be given on the caregiving economy. We need to formalize it. Next is the comprehensive policy on home-based care. Very important. Again, if you have to formalize this home-based care, we need to make sure that we 
give adequate focus to different aspects of the home based care be it the nomenclature be it the progression of career in this particular uh, sort of uh, home based care or if we have got the proper uh, you know we need to focus upon the grievance redressal mechanism so these aspects need to be catered upon next is the awareness with respect to the maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens act of 2007 so a data said that almost 12% only 12% of the old age people were aware with respect to this particular act so adequate awareness has to be created with respect to this act next is strengthening the pension system pension is one of the most important social security cushion for the old age segment so therefore adequate provisions have to be made by the government and also by the individuals so that they have got access to the pensions when they reach to, to their old age next is the replication of switzerland time bank initiative see there is a particular uh, sort of initiative in switzerland where the youngsters are actually saving time how by caring the by giving care to the senior citizens and once they save this time this time can be used by these particular youngsters when they uh, you know get sick or when they become old right so that is what the concept of the saving the time is right and that can also be replicated in india so what we see is that see this segment of the society it should not be treated like a liability right and what we are seeing is that yes this particular sort of old age people right they are suffering from a lot of issues and adequate provisions have to be made so that their sort of this this uh, notion of treating them as a liability it can be transitioned to getting the experience learning from their experience and making sure that they also contribute to the overall development of the society of the country as a whole so therefore these measures should be there at the place now before we go to the next topic we have a particular mains question so the question says the increase in the life expectancy in the country has led to newer health challenges in the community what are those challenges and what steps need to be taken to meet them right so do answer uh, do write an answer on this particular question so the next article is with respect to the women in science technology engineering and mathematics domain that is the stem domain so what we have been witnessing is that that there is a technological disruption in almost all the domains right and that calls for adequate participation of women in this stem right now this is with respect to gs1 that is role of women and social empowerment and gs2 issues relating to the social sector now see this acronym stem it was basically introduced in the year 2001 by the national science foundation of the united states right now this basically implies that it is a curriculum designed for the student which focuses upon the four specific disciplines that is science technology engineering and mathematics now if we talk about india india has been one of the largest scientists and researchers around the world so it has been sort of giving a lot of scientists and researchers to different countries domestically also and to different countries around the world right now we also have the uh, article 51a which actually gives which says that it's the duty of every citizen to actually inculcate that scientific temper and to promote the spirit of enquiry now what is the significance of this particular domain that is science technology engineering and mathematics see we have got the industrial revolution 4.0 which comprises of various technologies for example artificial intelligence or machine learning or cloud computing now all these all these domains they require a proper skill set and for that we need to train the human resource in that particular domain right next is to deal with the current challenges we all know that we are living in the times where we are facing a lot of challenges in terms of the climate change mitigation or adaptation or in terms of the non conventional challenges for example the organized crime be it the cyber security right or we have got the other issues for example the food security now all these require a sort of great investment in the technology a great investment in research so therefore the stem becomes important next is the nsf report that is the national science foundation report of the united states which says that in the next decade almost 80% of the jobs which would be created they would require some form of maths or some form of science related knowledge right so that is what the nsf report says now if we talk about the women in this particular domain what we see is that according to the global gender gap of report of, of the year 2024 which is released by the world economic forum what it says is that the workforce participation that is a women workforce participation in the stem domain it's at 28.2% when compared to the non stem workforce participation it is around 
47.3 percent so when it comes to the stem participation women are participating less in this particular stem related jobs right next 43 percent of these stem graduates in india they are women however the point of concern is that even though we have got almost 43 percent of women who are actually uh, you know studying different stem subjects but it is only 20 percent that participation in these stem jobs it's only 20 percent next is that what the report says that there is almost a 81 percent gap in the research and development domain in india that is gender gap when it comes to the research and development in india so we have got a huge gender gap in this particular aspect now what are the causes for the low participation of women in stem the first the very first is social conditioning see please un understand that when we live in a society we develop a particular perspective and that perspective defines what kind of role a person has so we are living in, in in the country and we have developed majority of the population in india have developed a particular perspective and that is not what is conducive that is not not conducive when it comes to the women participation in the stem related fields right so they have got different kind of perceptions and mostly it's sort of the stereotype view right which they have so the social conditioning it leads to the lesser participation of women in these particular domains right they would be more inclined that the women should go into the humanities field or they should go in up uh, in a particular field rather than joining the stem workforce next is negative gender stereotype as i just said so we have developed a particular uh, negative gender stereotype and that is basically primarily because of the patriarchal mindset also the parochial view which we have and that is actually restricting the participation of women in this particular domain that is stem next is there is a great social bias when it comes to these stem domains see we have you know people say this that there are certain subjects for example biology right so they consider biology as a subject which is a weak science and they say that it is primarily meant for the women and uh, they should be restricted to their kitchens and what they say is that they should not participate in the other domains like the physics or maths which are sort of strong uh, sciences right so that is a kind of parochial mindset which is there and which is inhibiting the participation of women in stem next is lack of support during transitioning to higher roles now for those women who are already in the stem uh, domain stem workforce they find sometimes that things are very hard for them for example when a particular woman is actually doing her postdoc or in fact doing her research she is at a time of her career where she has other responsibilities as well for example childbearing responsibilities or family obligations so and the construct of the indian society says that that they give more importance to these things rather than the contribution made by the women in her own field right so that is where the women has to leave her particular job for a certain time period and then that leads to the reduction in the sort of contribution in the stem domain next is retention related challenges there is the glass ceiling in different organizations and many of the instances have also been there where the women have complained with respect to the toxic work environment which is there right moreover these women's are restricted to the lab related works they are not made to interact with other people and the interactive jobs they are majority uh, in majority of the cases they are done by the males so over there there are retention challenges also also according to government's own data there is a wide disparity in the pay right so there is a huge pay gap almost 35 percent pay gap right so that is also that serves as a disincentive so these are some of the reasons now what have been the government initiatives when we talk about promoting the uh, participation of women in these stem related works the first is the vigyan jyoti scheme by the department of science and technology now this is primarily to enhance the participation of women in the further studies now this is for a segment of the population that is from the students the girl students from class 9th till 12th right so the dsc is providing those facilities those subsidies so that it can enhance their participation in the stem related works next is the kiran dsc scheme so we have got the knowledge involvement in research advancement through nurturing scheme by the department of science and technology and we have got a sub scheme that is women in the science and engineering field right so this is a sub scheme of the kiran 
both these aim to enhance the participation of women in different domains next is the gender advancement for transforming institutions now it primarily aims to enhance the gender equity when it comes to the higher education next we have got the curie scheme by the department of science and technology now this stands for consolidating the university research for innovation and excellence now this primarily aims at expanding the research facilities for the women in that particular university next we have got the science an engineering research board and it has a particular sort of scheme known as power now this provides it aims to provide the financial aids or the grants to the women researchers next we have got the biocare now this stands for biotechnology career advancement and research program now this basically implies that they, it is providing incentive for the women to become biotech researchers right next we have got the indo us fellowship for women now these are specific fellowships which are given to the women in order to promote their participation in various stem related fields now what should be the way forward the first and the foremost is that there is a need to break the gendered notion of intelligence we cannot have this view that you know boys are meant for this or girls are meant for this there has to be a stop we need to put a stop on this particular gendered notion of intelligence and we need to make sure that there is you know we we give the equal opportunity to all the genders right irrespective of whether they are males or females or even the transgenders right next is the incentivizing institutions to promote gender equity there has to be sort of awareness programs where in the institutions itself we don't actually put a seed of that stereotype in the minds of the children we need to make sure they grow with the mindset that all are equal and all have the equal opportunity and that has to be done at the very primary stages in the school itself right next is there have to be supportive provisions at the workplace as we just said that these glass ceilings they need to be done away with and what we need to focus upon is that they are given adequate opportunities something on the lines of you know social security they should be provided with the crash facilities or they should be given the maternity benefit and that particular benefit should not restrict their career progression then we have got role models so the very important examples or very famous example is of tessie thomas tessie thomas right and now the, she is known as the missile woman of the country or, or we have got dr kalpana chawla uh, uh, then we have sunita williams so people should learn from them and they should incorporate or they should imbibe in their mindset this particular idea that no gender is superior to the other when it comes to learning about these different uh, sort of subjects like science technology or engineering or mathematics so what we see is that we need to have adequate participation of women in uh, different domains and we need to make sure that uh, the, we give the adequate incentives we provide the adequate services we provide the adequate help to to those who really want to pursue a career in stem and make sure that there are no biases in place we need to make sure that there are equitable opportunities for all in this particular domain right so before we go to the next topic we have a particular main practice question the question says women participation in stem in india suffers from various factors despite many initiatives by the government discuss so do write a particular answer on this now the next topic is with respect to the anti conversion law so what we recently saw was that that the uttar pradesh legislative assembly it has passed the uttar pradesh prohibition of unlawful conversion of religion amendment bill of 2024 now this actually makes the law stricter by providing the maximum punishment of life imprisonment now this again brings to the fore the debate surrounding the anti conversion laws in india right now this is a part of gs2 fundamental rights now first of all what are these anti conversion laws right so see these are nothing but the legislative measures which are aimed to prevent or prohibit the religious conversions right and they basically they actually aim to prevent the forced or induced conversion see what we have found is that there have been many instances where the particular community and that to some mostly in most cases the vulnerable the vulnerable communities they are actually given they are induced or they are given the lure of money or lure of other resources and that is what makes them to convert to the other religion now this is not something which is out of their inclination towards the faith it is out of the forced reasons that is not something related to the particular faith itself or their sort of spiritual inclination towards that particular faith right so that is where the different governments different state governments have come up with these anti conversion laws now see it was the union law ministry in the year 2015 which made it very clear that the parliament of india 
is not entitled to make a law with respect to the conversion right therefore what we see is that many of the states in india almost more than 10 states they have come with the freedom of religion statutes that is anti conversion laws now how do these anti conversion laws violate the rights of the people see we have article 25 now this article 25 talks about the freedom of conscience and to freely profess practice or propagate religion now once you are actually restricting someone from converting to the other religion it is a violation of that particular right right next is the article 191 sub clause 1 sub clause 8 now see please understand that we have got the freedom of speech and expression under this article now if a person engages in a particular discourse with respect to any religion if he wants to practice that religion he'll have to seek the permission before he actually changes the religion permission from the government so that is also an infringement of his right next is the right to privacy religion is a very private part of someone's affair and we know that it was in the year 2017 in the famous case of ks puttaswamy that the supreme court declared the right to privacy as a fundamental right under the article 21 of the indian constitution that is right to life and personal liberty now if someone has to seek the government's approval before he or she changes a religion so that is isn't that not a infringement to, of that person's privacy right next is the article 14 that is equality that is equality before law and equal protection of laws so what we see is what there there have been allegations that this particular conversion it is these anti conversion law they are primarily against the particular minorities there have been allegations next is a right to dignity again we can link it with the right to privacy also so we dignity it's you know practicing a particular religion is a part of someone's dignity and if someone is needed if there you know if that person requires the approval of the government to practice a particular religion that is also again the infringement of the right to dignity then we have got again alleged suppression of the minority now this is in terms of the in unequal treatment which is actually being showcased because of this anti conversion law so there have been allegations as i have already said that there have been allegations which say that this anti conversion law they are primarily aimed at a particular community now however it was the case of the s pushpa bai case where the supreme court very categorically said said that see any person can convert to any religion provided that conversion is voluntary is voluntary and is sincere right so there comes the condition it should not be out of the lure of money it should not be induced right that is what the supreme court meant so what is the need what are is the need of anti conversion laws in india that is where the this particular directive in the s pushpa bai case leads us to that there is a need of anti conversion laws in india first is that it prevents coercion and fraud if the conversion is not out of the spiritual in uh, sort of inclination of that person towards a particular religion obviously that should not be uh, then carried out right that should not be allowed that is where it prevents the coercion and fraud next is it preserves the social harmony if you will have a lot of these anti conversion uh, sort of sorry if you will have a lot of conversions which take place very frequently that would obviously lead to a mistrust in the society it would lead to greater conflicts right so to prevent those conflicts we have got these anti conversion laws and it maintains the social harmony next is that it protects the cultural identity so if you have a particular segment of society following a particular religious path right and if out of the inducements or lure of money if they are made to convert so that would not be able to preserve their earlier or original cultural identities so that is where what we need to keep in mind is that in order to make sure that the people actually focus upon and preserve their cultural identity the such type of conversion should not be allowed next it addresses the national security concerns there have been allegations that many of these conversions they are because they are actually funded by the non state actors outside the country many of the foreign entities many of the foreign organizations have been funding illegally and have been making such conversions in india so obviously it's a national security concern now what have been the supreme court's verdict on supreme court's views 
on religious conversions. Now we can actually look at some of the very different cases. The first is the Hadia versus Ashokan KM. In this particular case, Supreme Court very categorically said that every adult has a right to marry a person of his choice, his or her choice, and to convert to a particular religion. Next case is that of the KS Putoswami case. In this particular case, Supreme Court said that the privacy of an individual is an integral part of the right to life and personal liberty that is under Article 21. And this privacy also includes includes the decision to stay with a particular religion to make sure that whether I want to follow a particular faith or I want to follow a different faith. The next is the Lata Singh versus state of Uttar Pradesh. Now in this particular case, the Supreme Court upheld the right of an individual to marry a person of his or her choice, right? Next, the Sarla Mudgal versus Union of India. Now in this particular case, Supreme Court held that if a person is changing his or her religious sort of affiliation, after marriage, because of the marriage, that is permissible. But that should not evade the legal obligations or the responsibilities which that particular person has, right? So what we see is that Supreme Court has interpreted in different ways, but there is a need of anti-conversion laws. So what should be the way forward? See. What we need to make sure is that there has to be a balance when it comes to the individual right versus the malafide conversions. Obviously, the society cannot accept the malafide conversions. Those conversions are only acceptable, which are out of the serious inclination towards a particular religion, which are out of the spiritual awakening, right? But if a particular conversion is actually rooted in the lure of money or some inducement, then that should be a part of the malafide conversions and that should be tackled through the anti-conversion laws. However, what needs to be kept in mind is that while making these anti-conversions laws, the state governments need to incorporate the views of the religious theologians, that is the religious community and different policymakers, the civil society organizations, so that they don't make a law which is seen against a particular religious minority, right? So that should be the way forward. Now, before we go to the next uh, topic, we have a particular question. The question says, the subject matter of anti-conversion laws by different states in India is fraught with various debates. Elaborate. So do write a particular answer on this. So the next topic is with respect to the reforming the Law Commission of India. So what we find is that the Law Commission of India has been instrumental when it comes to the reforms of the legal domain in the country. It has recommended many new laws. It has recommended amendments to various laws, right? But what we see is that right now it is in the need of serious reforms. Now, this is a part of GS2, executive and advisory bodies. Now, if we talk about the Law Commission of India, what we see is that it is an executive body. Right. Do remember, it can be very important for the prelims exam. And it acts as an advisory body to the Ministry of Law and Justice, Government of India. Obviously, once it's a, if it's an advisory body, it comprises of judicial experts or legal experts. And mostly, uh, it has been the justices, the chief justices of different high courts who have been the chairperson of this particular law commission. So there have been different law commissions. Now, the first law commission in the colonial times, it was based on the Charter Act of 1833. Now, I really want you to answer me, who was the first chairperson of the law commission, right? In the pre sort of independence times, right? Do answer and post in the comment section. Let me see who answers first. But the first law commission in the independent India, it was established in the year 1955 and uh, it was chaired by the MC Sitalwad, who also acted as the Attorney General of India. Now, the latest law commission of India, it was constituted in the year 2022 and it is the 22nd uh, law commission of India and it is chaired by the former uh, Chief Justice of the Karnataka High Court, that is Ms. Justice Rituraj Avasti, right? Now, the problem is, the issue with respect to Law Commission of India is, as it's an executive body, it has no fixed composition, it has no defined eligibility criteria, and it has no set functions. Now, this is all actually given to the whims and fancies of the executive. It is the executive which decides all these things. Also, we have got the terms of reference of the uh, commission, which are specified each time the commission is constituted. Now, this actually leads to a lot of problems. Now, what has been the role of law commission in the legal reforms? First and foremost is that it has suggested amendments to outdated laws. And it has made sure that the laws are in conformity to the needs of the time. 
it has given various recommendations with respect to different laws with respect to different uh, sort of um, amendments making sure that these laws incorporate the needs of the society right next is ensured statutory obligations of india so it has also made sure that once it comes to the international agreement it has also recommended many of the changes to different laws so that the indian laws are in alignment to the international agreement next it has also taken up issues with respect to the show moto basis for example the 20th law commission it actually took up the law uh, against the leprosy leprosy right so to make sure that uh, the people having leprosy they are not sort of discriminated right next is contributions towards the progressive development and codification of laws again as i said the first point that it has given a series of recommendations with respect to different laws and it has given almost 281 sort of reports till date now this is obviously a very huge number now what are the reforms which are needed to strengthen the law commission of india so it was the justice ap shah who also acted as the chairperson of the law commission of india who was the chairperson of the law commission of india so he gave some of the recommendations first he said was that there has to be a statutory status when it comes to the law commission of india different law commissions of in, uh, uh, around the world they are actually responsible accountable to the parliament they are not accountable to the executive right so what we see is that if it is given a statutory status it would be accountable to the parliament of india right not to the executive next continuity what it means is see every law commission is set up for a period of three years but once it is set up again after the three years expire there has been a gap between these two commissions for example the 21st law commission it actually expired the term expired in the year 2018 but the 22nd law commission of india it was established in the year 2022 so there was a gap of four years right so if we have a statutory status so that would obviously make sure that the uh, there is a continuity in the establishment of the law commission of india next the appointment what has been uh, observed is that many of the times we have got the appointment which is done by the executive and that is has shown a kind of favoritism there is a favoritism involved so there has to be a proper foolproof process without biases without partiality so the members who are appointed to this to this very important body they are really expert in that particular domain next independence see at present we have got the law secretary uh, as a part there are two uh, positions which are ex officio members of the law commission of india now obviously this is sort of not in sync with the kind of duties which the law commission has so there should not be the presence of the executive in this particular commission so that is what justice ap shah re recommended so what we see is that law commission of india has been one of the oldest bodies when it comes to the uh, framing of laws in the country so therefore it also needs serious overalls for example what we have done with the national commission for women or the national commission for scheduled castes or scheduled tribes so there has to be either it the status has to be turned to a statutory basis or it should be made a sort of constitutional basis so that is what you need to know about the law commission of india now before we go to the next topic we have got a practice question so the question says the law commission of india is the oldest among the national level parastatal bodies with distinct importance however it needs serious reforms discuss so do write an answer on this so coming to the prelims snippet section we have got the first topic as the confederation of indian industries so the confederation of indian industries is a non-government not-for-profit industry-led industry managed organization now it has a lot of members around nine nine thousand members from the private as well as the public sectors including the small and medium enterprises and many multinational corporations so it works closely with the government on different policy issues and make sure that there is enhancement in the efficiency competitiveness and business opportunities for the industry now it has many center of excellences and it also strives to increase the industry competitiveness uh, through promotion of innovation technology adoption partnerships for sustainability and it also assists industry across various domains not just related to the work related domain or that of or that particular sort of sector specific domain but also it works in different other areas for example it focuses upon the sustainability aspect or uh, the affirmative actions then on the livelihoods diversity management skill development empowerment of women sustainable development now it has almost 70 offices including 12 center of excellences in india and also has eight overseas offices in us in uk in uae and different other countries so that is what you need to know about the confederation of indian industries 
coming to the next topic we have got a reference or a, a sort of an information with respect to a particular invasive alien species and that is prosopis juliflora now please understand that it is a very important topic a question has already been asked in the prelims so please pay attention now this is a basically a shrub or a small tree and it is a kind of mesquite a kind of plant now it is native to mexico south america and the caribbean it is not native to india obviously it's an invasive alien species it is one of the most most in invasive species in arid and semi-arid areas now initially it was brought to the country in the year 1920s to promote the forestation efforts right as when when the national capital was being built now in india it is known by look by different names for example bellary jali or other names right next it has a very wide ecological adaptability which can grow on soils from sand dune to clay soil and from sal saline to alkaline uh, soil types it can grow below 200 to above 1500 meters above sea level and with a mean annual rainfall ranging from 50 to 1500 millimeters now just see the kind of ecological adaptations which this particular plant has and that's the reason it grows almost in every condition next it is considered an invasive plant we already discussed about that it is characterized by vigorous growth which helps them to outcompete the indigenous plant species so you can see an effort going on where a particular jcb it's trying to remove this particular species now next we have got the parak now parak is an it's a national assessment center now this is in line with the national education policy so we the national education policy actually tried to bring a new assessment kind of system and the parak is one such system which the government has come up with so it's a benchmark assessment framework parak has been proposed by the uh, national education policy 2020 it function it actually functions as a standard setting body for the student assessment and evaluation for all the school boards in the country and put an end to the emphasis on their rote learning see primarily the objective is to study different state boards and come up with solutions and make sure that the transition of the student from one board to the other is smooth right so the mandate of the parak is to bring uh, the different school boards across the states and union territories to a common platform it acts as a common platform for the interaction of the concerned stakeholders in order to develop a holistic approach next the aim of the uh, the, the particular the system assessment system is to establish a unified framework that enables seamless transitions for students moving between different boards or region this includes aligning curriculum standards grading systems and evaluation methodologies to enhance the credibility recognition certificates and grades obtained in different across different state boards right so this is what you need to know parak is the assessment center in line with the national education policy and that is basically intended to remove the disparities among different state boards in the country now next there's a reference with respect to a particular country and this country is in the middle east upsc has been you know it's it's in the they, it has been asking questions with respect to the middle east a very important and one of the favorite uh, areas geopolitical areas when it comes to the questions so do pay attention so you can see we have got the country of lebanon now this borders the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Sea, so you can just see we have got the country of Lebanon. Now this has borders with Syria. If you just look at this map, you can see that Lebanon has a sort of borders with Syria. Uh, just before few days, we also had a discussion with respect to very, very important geographical location and that is the Golan Heights. Right. So this is a part initially a part of Syria, but it has been sort of captured by Israel. Right. So we have got Israel, which is bordering Lebanon, and we have got the capital of Lebanon as Beirut. Right. And now this is the Mediterranean Sea. Also, you can also see that we have got Cyprus over here. Now, this becomes really important because, as I said, Middle East has been, you know, it has frequently come in the news and it has been frequently asked by the commission as well so you can also have a look at other uh, other areas for example we have got the Caspian Sea we have got Iran we have got Iraq and then we have got the Persian Gulf and we have got the countries like UAE Oman Yemen Saudi Arabia and just see that Jordan Jordan as a country Jordan as a country it is landlocked however Lebanon is not landlocked so just have a look this might be important for your upcoming prelims I hope you enjoyed the session all the best thank you